Hello there, and welcome to another episode of Open Source in Business. Today, I'm joined by Ben Adida, who's the um, CEO, Executive Director. What I'm not executive sure exactly what the corporate structure of Voting Works is. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, so I'm an, the Executive Director. Executive Director of Voting Works, uh, which is an elect election tech company that uh, was started in 2017, 2018. 18. 2018, yeah, um, and had a successful, as far as I can tell, run in the 2020 elections in the US. Um, as you know, here on Open Source and Business, we we talk about uh, some of the topics that don't get treated as often uh, in the kind of um, the tech media. Uh, so we're, we're taking a, a lot of, this year, we, we've really had a theme of uh, technology and open source for social good. I've spoken to a number of humanitarian open source and, and uh, open source for social good entrepreneurs. And I'm really glad to have you on this week, Ben, to hear about what's happening in the election tech world. I'm happy to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. So can you tell me first, uh, right, your background is um, long and, and detailed, but I first, I know of you from the Mozilla Foundation or Mozilla Corporation. Right. So right. you were, you used to work uh, for Mozilla for, for many years, is that correct? Uh, not many years. I was a Mozilla fan for a number of years, for many years. Uh, I worked for Mozilla for two years in uh, 2011 to 2013. Uh, I mostly worked on uh, identity, what was Mozilla persona at the time, Mozilla's uh, attempt to improve uh, online authentication, you know, mm -hmm. kill passwords, that kind of thing. So that's, that's uh, but I've been an open source developer for a very long time since 1998, I would say, uh, and uh, and so all, Mozilla has always been close to my heart, and open source okay. always, has always been close to my heart. And it was your um, your former colleague John Lilly, who's a former guest of the show, well, it was actually told me that you were now working on election tech, which got me started on 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 this conversation. That's right. John is on our board at Voting Works, so yes. Uh, so can you tell me how you got into this area? How did how did Voting Works start? What was the the genesis? Um, you know, why why this mission, and yeah. why you? Right. What said? Uh, what brought you to it? That's a great question. So um, very briefly, I got interested in voting technology back in '97. Uh, when uh, I was an undergraduate, and I'd been interested in security and cryptography. And voting is one of these quintessential, like almost fundamental problems of security where, and it's, it, it's not often, it's not often perceived that way. It's, you know, when you, not everybody necessarily thinks about everything that goes into voting, which is totally fine. Um, but voting depends on a secret ballot and voting also depends on public trust in the outcome. And those two things are at odds with each other because if you want a secret ballot, and that's a very strong property, by the way. It's not just a secret ballot if you choose for it to be secret. It's a secret ballot ideally enforced by the voting system itself. And when I say system, I mean technology with processes and everything around the election. In other words, it's not okay if people are willing to sell their votes for a hundred bucks. Like we don't want a system that allows that. So it's not a question of optional privacy. It's a question of privacy secrecy of the ballot that's enforced by the system. But if you have secrecy of the ballot, how do you have an audit? How do you have auditability that the votes have been counted properly? So that's kind of a fundamentally interesting tension, which uh, is exactly the kind of thing that gets any security minded person really excited. Like, aha, here's a tension. Can I resolve it with some fancy math, right? Um, and that's how I got into it initially. I worked on some uh, uh, initial voting uh, research uh, at MIT. Uh, I left for a bit. Uh, between my master's and PhD, and I did a bunch of open source work in industry, not related to voting, just open source web stacks. And I came back and did my PhD from 2003 to 2006 on cryptography applied to voting security. So that's how I got into voting. I've always been interested in it, uh, or at least you know for a very long time. Um, and uh, I did a postdoc at Harvard where I worked on an end-to-end -end verifiable open source voting system called Helios, which is in active use right now by a number of nonprofits, actually was used by the uh, open source initiative uh, just recently for their uh, board elections, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, is used by a number of open source communities for their for their elections. I've so I've been doing well. it. You've um, used it. There you go. Yeah. So I've been, I've been doing this for a while. Uh, and, uh, and, and then I took a break from voting for a little bit. And in 2018, 
came to the conclusion that um, I really would enjoy spending my time on voting full-time again, and not just um, online voting for private organizations and nonprofits and clubs and things like that, but actual public office elections. Mm -hmm. And for public office elections, the parameters are very different. And it, it you know, it's, it's not the work I've done uh, for uh, with Helios. It's really work that needs to be about in-person voting, also vote by mail, uh, but not voting over the internet. That's not, that, that's for many reasons, that's not uh, something that I would recommend at this point, at any level of scale. Um, and so that meant building voting machines, building scanners of ballots, building uh, ballot marking devices for voters with disabilities or voters who prefer to use a touch screen that prints a ballot. It's about building that entire technology stack. And I got really excited about that in 2018 and started voting works at the end of that with this idea that the fundamental idea was it's clearer now, I think, by the way, than it was back then. There was more of a feeling back then, but now I can say it in uh, hopefully better words, that if you think about election officials who really have been uh, around the world, but I'll sp speak specifically about the United States, have been absolute heroes over the last few years, given all the disinformation around elections, given all the stress of voting in a pandemic, they have a job that is as transparent and as publicly accountable as you can imagine. They test voting systems publicly before an election so people can see if they wanna show up and see how the equipment is tested, they, they can do that. When you have voting at the precinct, you have, you have to have observers, like people who can just come and watch and see how it's done. After an election, and you have increasingly more and more post-election audits, sometimes a specific kind called risk limiting audits, which is really powerful statistically to give you confidence that the ballots are being counted properly. That's done in the public eye. That's done. You can, you can go and watch one of these audits. And so you have this level of transparency to the election process that election officials um, abide by, are subject to. And yet the equipment they use couldn't be more secretive if you tried or if you designed it for a movie, right? Like it's, right. You, you, you can't go online and find out what this equipment looks like. You can't get documentation for how this equipment works. You sure as heck can't get source code for how this equipment, for, for this equipment. And so we have this insane imbalance between what the job of election officials is, which is to be fully transparent about what they do and how existing vendors in this space approach the problem. And so the point of voting works is to be a voting technology vendor to election officials that meets the same bar of transparency that they are already subject to. So for for those who are unfamiliar with the U.S. Yeah. electoral system, that's um, true. I should give which some time includes yeah. many Americans, but also you know a lot of people <laughs> uh, outside yeah. of America. Uh, so uh, the United States is a federation. Each state yeah. decides individually how it will do its voting. And uh, many states also have kind of home rule rules where towns individually run elections for uh, their budgets and, you know, the, the dog collector and the, um, the local That's sheriff. Right. And, uh, you That's know, right. so you've got towns, counties, states, and then the federal system, um, right. which I guess has there, there has never been a federal referendum in the US, but I know there is a, there is the capacity to have one. I don't. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think so. I don't know for sure. I'm not an expert on, on that particular yeah. slice of it. Yeah, there's so but, many um, different expertise level, like slices of expertise in the right. election system. Uh, yeah. But yeah. where where is your focus? Is your focus on the the local elections, or is it on statewide elections? Is it on all of them? Right. It's it's on all of them because all of them are run with the same equipment, right? And okay. oftentimes, and in fact, if you're not in the U.S. and you're always confused, you should be confused. Why is this an issue in the US on voting equipment and all this stuff? Like, why is this even an issue? You know, if I'm in France or I'm in Germany, I just, I put, you know, I, I have one or two questions in an election. I just put the piece of paper in an envelope or I just drop the piece, like, and then we just count them by hand. Why is this so complicated in the US? And what you described is why it's so complicated. It's because there are local elections, there are county elections, there are federal, state level positions, and there are federal positions. And we put them all together on the ballot. And that creates a hugely complex ballot. Uh, it, it's as simple as 
Can you make piles of ballots to count them? And in the US, the answer is no, you cannot, because the ballot contains 20 questions or 40 questions. And mm -hmm. there's been elections with as many as 96 questions <laughs> on a particular ballot, which is yeah. a little much. But the point is, that is the federal system gives you that complexity of the ballot. And it's not just how many questions you have, it's the variation, because your next door neighbor might be voting on a different uh, school district than you, right? Like if they're across the street and in a different district. So the, the ballot styles, the different configurations of ballots of people that, that people vote on, even at the same precinct, sometimes you can show up at the same precinct, and depending on where you live, you might get a different ballot style. It's that complexity that requires the use of some technology. And then the question is when you bring in technology, how do you make sure that you also can trust the outcome of that election? So that's, we get a lot of complexity from the political structure, uh, the, or the, the governmental structure of the United States. And, um, and then we have to figure out how to deal with that complexity with just the right amount of technology. Okay. Um, and those of us who are old enough will remember um, the recounts in Florida in 2000. That's right. And, you know, uh, the words that became universally known was, was chat, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So we're going from increasingly um, like manual punch machines, which are then mm -hmm. counted, counted um, mechanically to yeah. electronic machines where you've got a screen and touch screen. Can you explain some of the reasons why the pure electronic voting approach is, is not fundamentally secure and, and what yeah. you need to have a secure voting system? Absolutely. And I think it's important to talk about the trend that there, there was a move to um, purely electronic, uh, what's called sometimes DRE in this, actually often called in the space DRE as in direct recording by electronics. Um, and that happened in the early 2000s. And then there was huge pushback and backlash from the security community uh, that uh, basically has made many of these machines go away. So 95% of people in 2020 voted on a, on a paper ballot. Um, now that paper ballot may be marked by hand or it may be printed by what's called a ballot marking device where you have an electronic interface that then prints a paper ballot and is still handled and verified by the voter and then cast in the ballot box. So why paper, right? Why do we, um, why do we ask for paper ballot? And it is to resolve this conflict of you need a secret ballot and you need a way to have public auditability of the system. And the paper ballot is the only universal interface. I'm gonna put a little asterisk on that because there's a caveat to that, but it is mostly universal interface for voters to be able to look at what their vote is, what, which bubble they filled, or what was printed by the machine. Confirm without the help of anybody else, because if you get help from somebody else, you don't have a secret ballot. Right? This is my vote, and I am putting it in the ballot box. And from there on, there is a process, a chain of custody that's maintained with seals, with audits, with logs of anything that might go wrong that ensures that those ballots are properly counted. And we don't know how to achieve these same properties that I just explained without the paper ballot. Mm. If it's electronically stored, how do I know as a voter that it was actually stored the, the way that I want it to be? You know, the, the, the joke among security experts is direct recording by electronics. That word direct is doing a lot of work. There's very little that's direct about people and electronics, right? It's all right. about indirection. And, um, and I think that's that's the central reason because of the secret ballot, where we want the voter to know only the voter to know how they voted, but some assurance that that vote was correctly recorded and correctly counted. We only know how to do that at scale with paper ballots. Um, yeah. So I've I've heard of um, elections which were purely electronic. That right. um, <laughs> the the result was off by thirty two thousand. 665 or whatever yeah. the number, you know, two to the power of, I guess, 17. Some one bit yeah. flip, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and like there weren't 32,000 people who voted in the election. So That's it was right. just like That's one right. specific bit that got flipped. And, and there was no way to know, you know, was that what happened? And, uh, and to actually, uh, you know, have confidence in the result when it happened. And, and did it only happen in one election or did it happen in others and so on? Absolutely. I think it's important. I mean, 
the thing that makes this, this hard to discuss is that there's a whole range of reasons why purely electronic systems can go wrong, right? Some of them are just, these are complex systems and they have failures and they have bugs, like all software, right? Yeah. Or in that case, you know, some cosmic ray that flipped a bit and there wasn't an error correction uh, mechanism. And so like we ended up with 32,000 extra votes, right? Um, so that's, that's, that's the whole slew of things. You can just say, look, no electronic system will ever be perfect. And so there will be problems. But the fundamental issue is that even if the electronic system is perfect, even if there is error correction, even if you've shielded it from cosmic rays, even if you've audited the code and theory improved your way to saying, yeah, this code is as good as it can be, you still have trust issues. You still have issues of like, okay, but is that the software yeah. installed on that machine, right? And hence it right. was installed. And so how do I know if there's no paper? How do I know that I know if there's no paper? How do I know that it's actually being recorded? Because the moment I walk away as a voter, what happens after that? You know, it can't check that the vote yep. was exactly what I had in mind, right? So you can have all the sanity checks you want. You can have all the blockchain you want. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you don't have um, some mechanism to ensure that the 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 record, the ballot of record, really reflects what the voter wants, and that's that's yep. that's the fundamental issue. We had uh, electronic voting. I'm I'm Irish, and yeah. um, we had electronic voting. We use single transferable vote. With right. multiple seat constituencies, uh, so yeah. it's a complicated counting process. We have, yes. you know, maybe fifty or sixty thousand votes in a constituency, and it can take multiple right. days to count. Yes. And yes. Uh, so we brought in electronic, direct electronic uh, voting yeah. uh, in a small number of districts, and um, um, I think it lasted two election cycles because right. at one point there was one candidate that was eliminated yeah. um, by you know three votes or whatever, something which would normally have triggered a recount. And there was no way to do a recount. It was like, well, we'll right. get them to do the same count again. And it was the same exactly. result again, of course. But there was no way to validate to actually check the ballots. That's exactly right. I mean, and the other example I give on this is everybody's keenly aware of how close some states were in the 2020 election, right? Georgia's margin was 0.3%. And so if you have a, uh, an election that's that close, right? 11,500 votes out of about 5 million, right? What do you what do you do to gain confidence that things went well? If yeah. you didn't have paper ballots in that election, it would have been a disaster, right? It was already even pretty with paper stressful. Ballots. Even, even with, with paper, paper ballots, ballots, it was already pretty stressful, still, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. One of the things that Voting Works uh, was very proud to do in 2020 is we uh, we also work on risk limiting audits. These uh, the software to help folks run these post election audits to make sure that the tabulators have done the, have declared the right winner, and um, I always have to caveat that because people say, what do you mean the right winner? I mean, the winner as dictated by the votes expressed by the voters, right? So right. That's the right winner. So, and we had software to help folks run the statistical process of selecting ballots. In that case, because of the margin, it's actually pretty simple. You have to select all of them. You have to review all of them. Uh, and we helped, uh, our technology and our team helped with that uh, full hand count audit that happened okay. the week after the election. But imagine what that would have looked like if there had been no paper ballots. If you had stories about like, I voted for you know Trump, but I'm pretty sure the machine counted my vote for Biden or vice versa, right? What evidence would you have to back up the statement that we got, we recorded the votes correctly and we counted them correctly? You have very little evidence to show exactly like your story, right? You just you just press the count button again and it gets you the same result, you know? How, wh th where's the trust there, right? As opposed to hundreds, thousands of ballot boxes with logs, with seals, with all of that, where you go, well, if there was a systematic attempt to corrupt this election, it would have left the trace, right? We would be seeing it. Uh, that's the that's the reason. Imagine what 2020 would have been like with purely electronic voting. Yeah, it was already pretty bad. <laughs> it was already pretty tricky. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you were involved in some of those uh, recounts, right? You mentioned Georgia. Were you involved in other recounts in the South? So uh, we... Uh, voting works so we have a piece of open source software that was uh, funded by the Department of Homeland Security CISA in particular that is the only piece of software that exists to help any American state any US state uh, and I say US state because it's customized for the structure of US states and risk limiting audits are particularly well suited to the way elections are carried out in the US 
Um, it is, uh, this software helps a state run this kind of post-election audit. Roughly, what does those, that audit look like? That audit looks like, let's look at the margin of victory. If it's very big, we don't have to look at as many ballots. If it's very small, we have to look at more ballots because we are effectively doing a statistical sample of the ballots and seeing, does that sample uh, support, uh, provide supporting evidence that we got the right results? And, right. Um, or, uh, you know, the, the right statistical statement is more, does it cap the possibility that we got the wrong results <laughs> is really what it's, uh, that, that what it's trying to say. But at the end of the day, it's X millions of ballots were cast. Let's look at a few hundred or a few thousand that are randomly selected and let's see what that looks like. And if you can tell intuitively if the margin is really big, you're not going to need that many ballots to see that show up. If and your the margin is very tight. Your software, software finds what a random sample is and says you need to have so many, right. so many ballots chosen randomly from so many boxes, precincts. How does that work? That's right. Our software implements a number of algorithms that have been vetted, written, built by others that have been in, in uh, the literature for a dozen years. And uh, most importantly, it implements the workflow that needs to be implemented between the state and the counties, sometimes the townships, because what's happening is the paper ballots are stored by the individual jurisdictions, but you really want the sampling to be done at the state level for reasons of efficiency. And so you need a bit of a, a choreographer of this dance, right? Where you right. report all the ballot manifests to the state, the state does the random sampling, dispatches audit requests to the counties, the counties then do the actual physical, let's go pick up ballot number three in this stack and see what it says and enter it into the system, feed it back up, produce the, the, the audit report. So we helped uh, a number of states do that in 2020. Georgia was the first one. It was a special case because the margin was so tight that turned into a full hand count. But again, the entire choreography of that hand count was done with our software. Uh, we helped Michigan, we helped Pennsylvania, Virginia, um, Rhode Island. Those are the ones that did statewide. And then we are helping a number of other states ramp up their process where I'm hopeful that we'll have more than 10 states running these audits by uh, 2022 and maybe 15 to 20 by 2024. Okay. And now we're talking about actually checking the tabulators in a statistically strong way. Um, and again, that's with software that we built that's open source uh, that we host and support for states. But we actually have, as of uh, last month, the state of North Carolina that's decided to install and host and manage the software on their own, which is exactly the open source model we wanted. We wanted it to be, we're here to back you and help you, but if you want to roll with it on your own, you can. And okay. we're really excited about that. Um, I see Nevada in your map as well. Was that uh, countywide? Did you do like Maricopa County or something? We were not involved in uh, uh, Mar Maricopa County, uh, but that's, um, let, me, let me check here. Uh, that's in Maricopa is in Arizona, but um, oh, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you? I was like, wait, did I get it wrong? No, it's. It, but in any case, no, we were not involved in in. That was, uh, that was one of the controversial yeah. counties, but it was not in Nevada. Yeah, there was, there was a different yeah. controversy in Nevada, right? Um, I, I don't remember. We we did not we did not help Nevada with a statewide audit uh, this year. We we are we we have uh, uh, we are always open to working with states who are piloting. It takes some time to build the skills to run these kinds of audits. Uh, and by the way, there are other audits that states run that uh, predate the risk limiting audit that are also pretty good. The right. beauty of the risk limiting audit is it has very strong statistical statements that it can make, whereas some of the other audit methods are a little bit more ad hoc. And so you get like, you're not quite sure how much confidence you really get from them. Have you seen any um, counties, uh, voting districts doing um, something like a state limiting audit for calibration of machines before elections? Uh, no, calibration of machines before elections is usually done with what's called logic and accuracy testing. And that is, uh, logic and accuracy testing is mostly meant to check, um, is the equipment configured properly? Did we send the right scanner to the right precinct? Is the touch screen, if there's a touch screen involved, is everything still working on the touch screen? Like every, okay. you know, like there's not a dead zone or anything like that. So it, it is truly logic and accuracy. It is not, it is mostly not a security test. Some some folks try to turn it into a security test, but ultimately right. it's not. The major way you test security of an elections is you go back to the paper ballots and you apply the principle of what that, that's called software independence, where you've used the technology for efficiency, but you have not 
and, and consistency, like a machine will always interpret a bubble the same way, whereas humans might interpret it differently. So you use it for consistency and speed, but you don't trust the technology. You do right. a, you know, a sample on it. So um, you should think of like pre-election testing, logic and accuracy is more for, did we dot the I's and cross the T's correctly? Okay. Did we configure all the machines properly? And then the risk limiting audit is truly the we're not going to trust the tech, right? Okay. We're going to make sure that it's. it's okay. I was I was curious whether you know as election districts would take a sample of the previous elections ballots, count them by hand, run them through the machine, and make sure the counts were identical. But so they do that with uh, usually with test decks for the current election. So they configure okay. all the machines for the current election. Then they'll fill out a few ballots. They'll have a pre-printed test deck. They'll put those through the scanners. They check that it gives the right results. So they do a little bit of that. Okay. But critically with that current elections configuration, because what you want is a week before the election, you want to have all your machines properly configured, whether those machines are ballot marking devices or whether they are scanners where voters are putting their hand marked paper ballots into. And you want them configured, locked away, sealed, and nobody touches them for the few right. days before an election. They are ready to go. And they've been tested for that election. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about the hardware and software. So it's all yeah. open source software, yes. off the shelf hardware. Yes. How hard was it to get like through the compliance process? Is there a compliance yeah. process and regulation yeah. process around voting machines? We are still, in, there is. It is not implemented the same way in every state. There is a federally endorsed process uh, called the Voluntary Voting Systems Guidelines that is run by the Election Assistance Commission um, with support from NIST. And that process is adopted fairly broadly by many states. Uh, and it is fairly onerous without going into too much of the details. It is unfortunately right now fairly biased towards uh, existing vendors that existed prior to 2015. And it's pretty complicated for vendors that, have, that were born like us after 2015 uh, because of a version transition where it's going between 1.0 and 2.0 and new vendors are not eligible for the previous version but of the standard, but the new version of the standard isn't quite baked yet either. So there's a bit of a, of a we're, we're in a bit of a limbo state right. right now, but we're moving very quickly towards supporting the latest standard. Okay. And uh, where we have gotten our voting machines um, in use is in states that have their own process for testing machines, but do not uh, enforce the federal process yet. So we started in Mississippi uh, there's a couple of other states that we are um, working on right now that um, I'll be able to talk about more soon. There's um, uh, a possibility of uh, doing a pilot in San Francisco that's being discussed actually right now with the city of San Francisco. And the main reason for that is that California uh, has actually been a huge supporter of uh, open source voting systems. They've had rules on the books that encourage open source voting systems even before those uh, have been created. And so right. they encourage pilots, small scale pilots uh, of these. So our work right now has on voting systems has been, um, I would say still narrow, but we've been able to build a system using commercial off the shelf hardware, using fully open source software developed in an open source way. You know, we're not, we're not developing it and then releasing it as open source. We are doing all of our development in the open on GitHub with pull requests and comments and tickets. You can go see everything we're working on right now. Right. Um, and uh, I think it's, I think the model's working pretty darn well. And as we work on certification uh, over the next few months, I think we've got a pretty great product that's dramatically more transparent than everything else out there. And cheaper or is you're not competing yes. on price? Well, uh, we are definitely competing on price. Okay. The, uh, the cost of the system is going to be somewhere between a third and half of other systems out there on the market. That's and that's per entirely beginning or um... per, per, per like, yeah, per equivalent machine. And there's actually some places where we could save even more money than that because um, the process for centrally scanning ballots, which is what you do when you have vote by mail, when vote by mail, a bunch of ballots come in and you're not scanning at the precinct, you're scanning at the county. Uh, our system is just qualitatively smaller, simpler, better, especially for small and medium counties. And so I think we can save folks even more money. The main way in which we're saving folks money is uh, one, we're a nonprofit, so we're not adding a, a ton of, of uh, profit margin there. And two, we're using off the shelf hardware. So we can just pick the best hardware and, and ride the wave of improving technology and, right. and diminishing prices, right? Which is critical. Cool. 
Um, but one of the things I've heard is in the civic tech world yeah. in particular, that compliance and regulations are often a barrier to entry. You've mentioned it yourself, a barrier to entry for new vendors and make it harder for this uh, kind of commodity off the shelf hardware because you know everything is certified hardware plus software together. Mm. Um, is that something that you've run into? How have you how have you gone around getting around on counties on uh, you know um, rules for uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for procurement? Um, I'm looking for procurement. Um, right. You know, how's, uh, I can it's imagine it's complicated. It is complicated, and ultimately, it's why Voting Works is an organization as opposed to a free form open source project. It's because we need to raise uh, you know philanthrop philanthropic money to go through the certification process to do all these things, right? So we are, you know, it's, it's an open source project, but it's also an organization that is uh, pushing that forward. It couldn't happen with, you know, uh, a ragtag uh, awesome group of volunteers that wouldn't be enough to, to, to okay. push it through that. So that's why we're, that's why we exist, right? It's because we got to push that through. Um, we got to build a product that is actually going to be certified, right? The, uh, the certification rules for voting equipment have become a lot friendlier to off-the-shelf hardware in this latest version. So we're actually quite optimistic about our approach uh, against the latest version of the voluntary voting systems guidelines. Uh, it does mean that you can't like immediately you can't just like swap out a component for another without at least filing some paperwork, right? Uh, we, you need to do like a little bit of change management if you're going to completely change the CPU that you're using, for example. Right, but um, uh, but again, I think the EAC is starting to make that easier, especially when you're starting to think about operating system updates for security. It, that used to require too much change process where you really want to make that super easy, right? Uh, so I think we're heading in the right direction on that front. And okay. yes, it's hard, but the hardness doesn't have to do with off-the-shelf hardware. It has to do with uh, where do you set the bar so that it's a meaningful standard but not so, but not so high, and not with so much legacy support that you're biasing towards the the older vendors, which right. right now is unfortunately the case. And I'm hopeful that EAC will fix that in the next few months. Well, I imagine that you know, in in a lot of electoral districts, um, security by obscurity has a certain attraction, and people are con concerned that using transparently documented hardware and software, particularly open source software. Uh, leaves you open to kind of all kinds of shenanigans that uh, instinctively people believe are harder with the proprietary systems, but in fact have been shown to be, I mean, in some cases easier with some of the Diebold hacks that I've seen. Right, right. So, you know, I, I don't think open source gives us free security, right? Uh, what open source gives us is transparency, which really, if anything, 2020 has proven that we need, right? Because right now you can have completely crazy claims made about, well, the source code of this machine is is bad. Well, how, do, how does anybody respond to that claim? You know, like the source code is secret, so you can't respond to it. So I think if we had that concern that you mentioned early on at Voting Works and saying, well, maybe we shouldn't explain open source too much to election officials because they might, you know, that's not what they're experts in. They're experts in a lot of other things. And it might confuse, it might scare, it might, you know, bring up all these, well, if the source code's available, how, how, how does it get secured, right? Um, we have not found that to be nearly as hard to explain and to get people on board with as we initially thought. Because ultimately, 2020 came along, and now you can say, wouldn't you rather see the source code? Right. right. Like, wouldn't you rather see how it's, how it's made? And... The key thing that I think about when I think about open source, sometimes people make grandiose statements about what it what it what it gives you, right? And it's not the silver bullet that solves all your problems, right? But one thing it does really, really well, especially if you develop in the open, not if you like develop and then like do this point in time release. If you develop in the open, is it it is an amazing forcing function on the quality and holding yourself to a high standard. Because if we do something that is underhanded or we we cut too many corners or anything like that, which anybody's gonna be incentivized to do at some point, right? Like you, oh, you we gotta meet this deadline, let's cut this corner, et cetera. Any corner we cut, it's in the permanent record, in the permanent public record, right? And 
that that makes us think pretty hard about how we, whether we should cut a corner or how we cut a corner. I mean, sometimes you have to make trade-offs, right? Right. But we have to think hard about those. And open source is an amazing forcing function for that. I think in the intense pressure that is building a voting system, if you don't have that forcing function, I'm a little worried about how that software is going to get built. Yeah. You know? so. And as you mentioned, I think, uh, you know, the, there's the cultural uh, bias towards transparent operation and election technology yes. in particular that makes it maybe exactly. easier and a better fit for open source. I think that now that we are, have understood how to connect those things, right, how to say, we're just doing the same thing that election officials have been doing all along, right? That's starting to make a lot of sense. You know, okay. it's not some complicated hocus pocus technical geekery. It's let's just be transparent. Let's just show our work. Let's just have open recipes for everything we do. Right. That's just so that's obvious to election officials. Yeah. There, there are an increasing number of open source election technology entities out there, right? I've heard of Voting Works. There's the mm -hmm. Open Source Election uh, Technology Institute. There's yeah. Open Source Voting Consortium. Yeah. Um, what differentiates you from them? And like, right. I, those are only the ones I'm aware of. I'm sure there are others. So my understanding is Open Source Voting Consortium uh, is a longstanding consortium of uh, activists and open source proponents that have been pushing for um, open source uh, voting systems in policy and, and whatnot. And I think that's great. It's made some impacts in particular in California. Uh, I don't know OSET's uh, latest plans. I think the reason that voting works exists, and OSET predates us by quite a number of years. They've been around since, uh, I think, 2007. Um, we came into it because there was not an open source voting machine. And we like to build products and open source is a means to an end. It's not the end goal for everything. It is a, an important way to provide transparency, but we thought we could bring something to the space because we are builders of products that people use. And that's where our, the experience of the team that we have. And we have a number of election okay. uh, experts on our team. So we're the only ones with an actual voting machines in market today. Uh, and and so I think that's how that's how we're different. But again, I can't quite speak to uh, OSET strategy because okay. I, I don't know what they're uh, exactly right. what they're working on right now. Yeah. Um, so when you're focusing on security, right? You've got mm -hmm. the physical security of the machines, making sure that people can't tamper with it. You've got yes. the security of the software, uh, auditing the software and making sure that it's not vulnerable to uh, vulnerabilities, I guess. Yeah. And then you've got the yeah. security of the process of accounting afterwards and mm -hmm. making sure that the accounting, that that process is all, like how do you repartition your uh, time and effort there? Is, are, are they all important and you concentrate on all of them? Um, we are concentrating on security efforts that will allow, that will leave a trace if there's a problem, right? So uh, one of the big things we're working on is an approach to, so open source software, it's out there, you can check it. That's already a good forcing function to see, make sure that our, and we do our own reviews and we hire external security reviewers, like all of that. Um, we're actually a little behind on having a vulnerability disclosure policy. That's something we're actively working on pretty, so that there is gonna be a clear way to engage with us if you find a, an issue in our code. Uh, so that's number one, right? Like that's the number one thing we do. The second thing you have to worry about when you're doing open source voting systems is, okay, great. How do you know that that's the code that's running on the machine, right? Right. And that's a, it's a little bit more intense of a problem in open source voting systems than it is in software that you run on your own system because software you run on your own system, you can do binary transparency, you can do, um, you know, build it for, from source. Like there's a lot more individual power you have as, uh, an enterprise or as an individual user. Here it's like an election official, how are they gonna check, right? That this is actually the right software installed. So we're working on a number of innovations here based on uh, secure boot to make sure that uh, with secure boot, we can have some high confidence that the right software is running on the machine. Uh, and we're working on ways to make that um, visible to election officials in a simple way. Like how do we help election officials do very simple chain of custody checks that allows them to actually get high confidence that, oh, as part of my chain of custody verification, I have verified that the right software is running on this machine. I can, we're still in the middle of working on that. I'll be able to say a little bit more, but it's all based on TPM, on secure boot, and on the fact that we can 
we can simplify in the voting space, right? There's, we can make the, the whole partition read only, like that code shouldn't change, right? And there's only a little bit of configuration information. So there's a bunch of work that we can do that's very specific to voting systems uh, that allows us to uh, have this kind of high level of confidence that the right code is working on that. That's super and, interesting. I hadn't considered like the, the software supply chain uh, security aspects of voting huge. software. And that's, um, that's, that's the biggest threat if you're it, of, on, on voting equipment, right? And now a lot of folks will tell you, who cares about that? You're going to run a post-election audit anyways that, to make sure your system is software independent. And I think, I think the world is a little bit more nuanced than that, right? You, the, the asterisk I never got back to, right, is uh, voters with disabilities, which I think we very often forget, right? And we've got to do as, uh, a better job as a technology, uh, as a, in voting technology, uh, We've got to do a better job to help voters with disabilities. And when we say voters with disabilities, you you think like, well, how, how many is, are we really talking about, right? Like um, uh, old people with uh, with uh, arthritis. Um, people that's exactly who, right. Yeah. And, and you, you know, it, it is not just a saying to say we are all just temporarily abled, right? We are all going to eventually have some disability mm -hmm. if we're lucky, right? If we're lucky, we grow old and get disabilities, right? Like that's that's what happens. And then of course, so. We think it affects about 10 million voters in the U.S., right? 10 million voters for whom filling out a paper ballot with a pen uh, may be impossible or difficult or painful, right? And and for those voters, you want to provide an interface that is, you know, like as you say, if you have arthritis, filling out 40 bubbles is a pretty painful endeavor, right? Like that's not great. But maybe tapping through 40 uh, uh, buttons on a screen is a lot more doable. Right. So thinking about how we do defense in depth, not just how do we check the paper ballots afterwards, but how do we make sure that that's the right software is running that on that machine, that it's usable software, that it hasn't been messed with, that it's still functional, you know, so that we can serve all the voters, including the ones who don't have the ability to visually check the ballot. Okay. That's pretty important. So, so there's open source code at the beginning, visible for everybody to see a number of trusted boot approaches that we are implementing to make sure that the right software is running on the machines when they're needed. And then software and process that we provide for post-election audits to make sure that at the end of the day, the ballots were counted properly. Those are kind of the three big themes of how we approach security. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the economics of, of this, right? You're, yeah. You are a nonprofit, but every, but how many people work for Voting Works right now? 15. What are your 50? 15, uh, one five. One five. One five. Uh, yeah. What are your like growth plans? What's the trajectory right now? It's the growth trajectory is going to depend a lot on uh, there's two there's two aspects of the work we do. There's voting machines, which will be slow because there's certification at the federal and state level, and then there's the state software that like this auditing software called Arlo that we've been working on, and we're looking at other avenues to build software to help support election officials at the state level. And that's mostly just software, software as a service or open source software that folks uh, uh, run on their own. I foresee a lot of growth in state software backed by Voting Works, uh, where we charge support and hosting, and we can make those programs sustainable. It's inexpensive for states. It's uh, sustainable for us. Uh, I see a lot of opportunity there to, to do a lot of good uh, for governments while maintaining a sustainable organization that's updating okay. the software and keeping it up to date. And we, we see opportunities beyond just um, uh, just um, uh, auditing. We Another avenue that we're exploring actively right now is election results reporting. So when you report all the results, how do you get that data out to the world? It is shocking how low tech and error prone that process is today because it's mostly people transcribing. Well, you will hope it's spreadsheets, but it's people transcribing numbers because a lot of these voting systems are air gapped for good security reasons. Yep. Right. And so you end up with, you know, the press sends out individual reporters to precincts so that they can write down the numbers that are printed on the wall and then call them in. And you, there was even in the, in the California recall yep. election, there was an error in reporting by CNN because of, a, of human mistakes, which are going to happen. So we think of uh, election results reporting as critical for public trust and for transparency and how the counting is happening. And right. so that's one of the areas that we are uh, exploring with uh, a small number of states that are interested in, in, uh, in looking into that. So 
That on the state level software growth, we see a lot of opportunity to do a lot of good in a sustainable way. It's pretty straightforward in terms of what it looks like. It's, you know, gov tech run by a nonprofit. It's great. Everybody wins. On the machines front, it's a much longer endeavor. There's certifications. There's, uh, you know, getting folks used to a new system. There's uh, purchasing cycles on, on these, which are, you know, about a decade long, right? So some states are ready to update, others are not. Um, and, uh, and so we expect that to take a while for us to really have broad national impact uh, on the voting machine front. But at the same time, I think where we're having impact, it's gonna be pretty big because our system is much simpler, much more affordable, we think more secure, uh, and that's, that's gonna have a pretty big impact. In terms of the sustainability model for that, uh, our approach is to sell the hardware at cost. So cost of components plus cost of production and to provide support contracts uh, to help states and counties work with it. Uh, that will be the way that we are sustainable ourselves. So how are you getting to that point? Is it philanthropic giving primarily? Yes. Um, philanthropic giving is, the, is our startup money. Philanthropic giving is like how we do the initial engineering and the bootstrapping and all of that. We get to a point and we did that extremely well or sometimes contracts, right? We got a government contract with, CISA DHS for the audit software. That was a huge piece included and some foundation grants that got us to sustainability. That program is sustainable now, right? It's, it, it's, it's great. On the voting machines, again, it's gonna be a, like a lot of philanthropy to get us going. Uh, and then at run rate, it's gonna be the support contracts okay. that maintain it. Um, so what, like, what does that run rate look like in terms of how many counties, towns, states you need to get to be sustainable? Viable. Yeah, I don't think we know that yet, <laughs> I, but I think it's, um, you know, we're not a large team, right? Like we're not a very big team. One of the really important advantages of uh, working in the election space is the product isn't going to change year over year. Right. There are some improvements we can make, but there's going to be a point where we've got a working voting system and we have to, of course, do security updates and tweaks here and there and the occasional bug fix and whatnot, mm -hmm. but it's not like, you know, you have to keep running forward with a huge engineering investment over a very long period of time. Eventually, these projects products are going to be mostly done, and then they'll be in maintenance mode, right? Right. And that is extremely appealing from a sustainability standpoint, right? We can keep a small team working on various projects and get to a place of sustainability and maintainability, and it won't be a giant uh, financial endeavor. I'm curious what the what the labor requirements are for assisting an election, right? If you have an election, is it is it by voter, voter machine? Um, is it each uh, by election? Like, how does that scale? How do we uh, how do we structure our support contracts? Like, let's say, uh, let's say the town of Littleton, Massachusetts, where I live, yeah. decides that they want to use your machines for their yeah. uh, town votes. Um, yeah. Like, what would that require from voting works in terms of, you know, the support that you would have to Right. Provide. So we try to we try to build our systems so that they require minimal support from us. So we're going to be there to train folks initially. We also, by the way, we have open documentation. You can go see how our system works at docs.voting.works. Like right now, you can go see our manual, right? Which no other vendor does, right? So we're producing videos, we're producing online documentations. So there's an initial bootstrap, and I think over time it, we will be needed less and less because we're going to have all this beautiful documentation that's available for folks to ramp up. Uh, but we help a little bit. We can also help with election definition creations, like the, the configuration of the machines can get a little gnarly, not because of us, just because elections are complicated. We are doing our best to make it as self-serve as possible. Right. Uh, and so, you know, if, if, if Littleton wants to use us now, uh, we would still be at the stage where we're going to come in and provide a lot of in-person help and whatnot. In about right. a year or two, we'll probably be able to ship stuff directly, do some video trainings, otherwise, you know, people will be able to use it without our help. That's our goal. We want this to be, uh, you know, the support uh, contracts that folks will sign with us will be for continuous software updates so we can come in and install stuff and whatnot. And we expect that eventually some folks will do that on their own. As far as okay. assuming certification allows them to do that, which might still be, you know, there might still be a need to keep paying support so that the versions can keep getting certified and whatnot. We have, we have to figure that out. So what what kind of time frame are you looking at for displacing some of the um, the traditional vendors here? Like, it's going uh, to take, take a decade. It's going to take a decade. <laughs> okay, but but you should expect Voting Works to be well ahead of everybody on certifying to the latest standard. You have to understand that voting machines that are in use today are certified to a standard that was published in two thousand and five, 
So pre all of the guidelines regarding touch screens predate the iPhone. It, they're meaningless, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's meaningless. Uh, and even then, most of the rules were drawn from a 1997 standard. So it's a mostly 97, kind of 2005 standard. And part of that today. is, is that you know a lot of the districts are using machines that were bought in like ninety nine two thousand and and need, yeah. to, need so, to continue to be able to use those right. Yes, but fewer. Like in fact, more and more uh, counties have bought machines that were built in the last few years, but they're still standardized to uh, certified to a standard that is woefully outdated, and it doesn't make any sense, right? So we voting works are going to be certifying to the twenty twenty standard that came out last year and is being tweaked and finalized by EAC and NIST. Uh, I expect that we'll be the first ones out the gate to do that. At least that's what we're, we're okay. looking for, you know, and uh, I expect that we'll be there in uh, about a year. So in terms of uh, uh, socioeconomics and how that plays into your adoption, right? Yeah. Being the first to be compliant with the standard, uh, do you expect to see take up from the more um, uh, affluent uh, parts of the country that you know, are kind of, they're going to be the first to jump on to upgrade their software when there's a new, or their, their systems when there's a new standard? Or are you hoping that because of the relatively lower costs that you'll be able to get into some of the districts that really need a lot of investment in election infrastructure, which are the, the lower income? Uh, it's, it's the latter, for sure. Like one of the main reasons that we're in Mississippi is because Mississippi is one of the states that uh, is the poorest in the country. And we believe that making a system that works in a uh, less privileged uh, rural county that doesn't have as big a tax base, that doesn't have a whole lot of money, that's, you know, considering like it's this or it's, you know, fixing uh, fixing the city hall, which is needs, right. needs a renovation, right? Like it's, it's some real hard trade-offs. The fact that we've built our system to work in that setting and to be affordable in that setting is something that I'm particularly proud of and that we're going to continue to do. So okay. which one goes first? You know, yes, it's true that some of the more affluent counties might go first because they can afford to upgrade. But ultimately, we are really hoping that this is uh, a system that and we're expecting that it's a system that's going to be um, implementable by the poorest counties in the U.S. because everybody deserves a, a vote they can trust. Yeah. So with, without getting too political, um, I think we, we will be wrapping up in a couple of minutes, but sure. without getting too political, um, there is something of a battle around uh, access to the ballot right now uh, right. happening in the US. Um, yeah. Are there any organizations, um, ideally they would be um, uh, apolitical organizations that are kind of aligned to this this fundamental principle that people yeah. should have access to machines that, that count their votes correctly. Yeah. Um, are there any organizations that are funding um, kind of hardware upgrades for, for, for poor election districts and, and that you are in discussions with about kind of rolling out machines for 2024? Not that I know of. And it's important to note that Voting Works is a nonpartisan organization. We work in red counties, blue counties, purple counties. Like we are mm -hmm. happy to work yep. everywhere. And we have, you know, we have very diverse uh, customers and uh, that's really important to us. Like we, yeah. we think that every eligible voter in the U.S. should get a chance to vote and get a chance to vote on equipment that's reliable, that's, that's uh, affordable, that's secure, that's open and transparent. Um, so our, I think everybody, all parties will do better if every eligible voter gets a chance to vote. And you know, our, our take on that is to be the nonpartisan organization that's providing technology to anybody who would like it and to prove our, non, our nonpartisanship by maximum transparency. Yep. We're a nonprofit. That means you know how we spend our money. You know where we get our money from. You know, like you know every you know our source code. You know where we work. You know everything we do. That I think, you know, if 2020 has shown us something, it's how polarized we can be as a country, mm -hmm. how much fracture, how much bigger fracture there can be between the parties. And if I'm going to be idealistic for a second, my deep hope is that one of the ways that we start to mend. Uh, these wounds is to recommit to the things that we all believe in, which is democracy. Start with that. That's the foundation, right? And then maybe we can build more agreement on top of that. Yeah. And that's uh, the point you make about red and red and blue counties is, is I think it's important to say that, you know, poverty is not uh, political, right? No. Um, and a lot of the poorest election districts in the country are 
are, you know, they're rural, primarily um, uh, majority white districts, as well as inner city, majority black. Uh, yeah. and, and, and even that split is not, you know, it, it, you have to be careful with that. Like, especially when you work, it, it's a generalization that doesn't always work. We work in Mississippi in counties that are very clearly red, counties that are very clearly blue. And it's not the, you know, city versus uh, versus rural split. And it depends on the state, right? So ultimately, uh, we work with any county that wants to provide better equipment to their uh, to their citizens. And that's critical to us. And it's an awesome mission. I, I'm, I'm Thank you. Honestly, I, it's been an honor to talk to you. I hope that the that you have Thank many you, long Dave. years of success. I appreciate that. Uh, in thank the coming you. Years. And thanks um, for the opportunity to chat about voting works. Yeah, thank you. And I, 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 I also had one question that I wanted to ask you is, is one sure. of the things I've noticed is that a lot of the people who are tech entrepreneurs, particularly yeah. in open source around Silicon Valley, and I know you're not in Silicon, are you in Silicon Valley? No, no longer. I'm actually pretty no close to you. I'm kind of yeah. shocked that you told me you're in Littleton. I'll, we'll talk <laughs> later. <laughs> Um, that that a lot of uh, French nationals seem to seem to be doing very well as as entrepreneurs in 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 uh, in the oh, tech industry. I'm wondering if there's if you have some insight into what what. Yeah. So for for for, 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 for for those listening, I am indeed a dual citizen. Uh, my family is originally French, and I am uh, I'm I was born in the U.S. Uh, I don't really have any particular insights on that. I think that's interesting. I I hadn't noticed that particular trend. That's interesting. I'll have to look into it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you for joining me today, Ben. Um, next you. week, uh, I will be releasing a video uh, interview that I did with Angela Brown of the Linux Foundation on the importance oh, of events cool. for oh, yeah. uh, for open source communities. I think uh, it's going to be. Yeah, I had a had a chance to talk to her a few weeks ago at the Open Source Summit in Seattle. So right. it will be my first uh, full episode, which was a live interview. I'm looking forward to it. That sounds great. Well. Thank you, Dave, again for the time and uh, good luck with the, the continuing uh, uh, podcasts and, and uh, videos. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, All right. Goodbye. Bye.